Tonight's headlines are brought to you in part by Coldwell Energy and McDonald's. Good evening, Commonwealth. Thanks for watching the Channel 2 News. I'm Chris Nelson. Let's take a look at tonight's top stories. MVA staff and officials head to Japan to attempt to bring more visitors from Japan to the NMI. Also tonight with the dollar now over 140 yen, we talked to a Japanese real estate agent who says it could be a great time to buy in Japan. And the rides were out, a very select group of automobiles out for show on Saturday night. In sports, we'll take a Yankee look at the past and a running look at the future. Stay with us. These stories and more are next. Need a new phone? Trade in now and get up to $500 off our best 5G devices. Trade in your older phone in any condition and step up to better savings and speeds only our 5G network can provide. Check out our website and catch up on the best mobile experience. Trade in now. Docomo Pacific, better together. We've made a lot of breakfasts, and along the way, we noticed something was missing. A warm cinnamon roll for breakfast, or with breakfast. A fluffy blueberry muffin from the drive through you're already driving through. A glazed apple fritter, which might find its way into your coffee. These are options every breakfast haver should have, and now they do. Meet the new bakery sweets at McDonald's. ba da ba ba, -ba. Tirawami and good evening Commonwealth. I'm Chris Nelson and our first story tonight with direct air service from Tokyo now a reality. MVA headed to Japan this weekend to participate in a travel show that features both domestic and international options for the Japanese consumer. Tourism Expo was held for the first time in Tokyo since 2018 and it happened at the Big Sight Convention Center, which is located just near Odaiba. The four-day expo-themed restart, taking on the challenges of a new era, focused on Japan's economic recovery from the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, Japan welcomed about 30 million tourists per year. In 2021, that number fell to just 250,000, and the yen is now depreciated to a 24-year low against the U.S. dollar, and this has led to a contraction of 2% GDP. First two days of the expo were B2B, business-to-business -business days, with prefixed appointments and walk-in meetings with travel, trade, and media partners, and the last two days B2C, business-to-consumer, and this is when we had cultural workshops on one side and a series of programs, including dance performances, talk show by Influencer K, video watching, quiz, and lucky draw on the other side of the booth. Takashi Ichikura and his team helped organize the NMI's presence at this year's Tourism Expo. Chris Nelson for the Channel 2 News. With the yen over 140, today 145 to the U.S. dollar, it makes goods and services here about 30% 30, 30 more expensive for Japanese tourists than just a year ago. That's bad for tourists coming south, but it could be an opportunity for island real estate not too far from here. We head to the north for this business tale. Stephen Underwood is a real estate agent based in Hokkaido. Underwood works for Century 21, and he lives just outside of Sapporo. He says that with the U.S. dollar's appreciation against the yen and two years of limited movement, Japanese real estate is a very good value. It's cheap compared to most other countries, uh, especially like an apartment building. Yeah, you could buy an entire apartment building for maybe 35, 40 million yen, and you're going to get guaranteed rent from Japanese tenants that like to stay longer. 
And there, we don't have university students renting apartments and moving out after three years. It's usually a family or somebody working whose company's in Tokyo and he's been sent to Hokkaido. And they stay for a really long time. Yeah, for the price of an apartment in Vancouver, you could buy an entire building here. We're in Otaru, a small coastal city just outside of Sapporo. It's near the ocean and also very close to ski slopes in the winter. This cable car takes you to the top of Tenguyama. And here you can jump in a tethered hot air balloon or catch a sunset. The seaside city is about an hour from Chitose Airport. It's famous for seafood, golf, snow, and canals. And it's a popular spot for Japanese and foreigners to visit. The combination of ocean and mountains make it a very desirable spot for second homes. This area is called uh, Hariusu. It's part of, it's in Otara. That's Otara, the aquarium on the, on the point there. This is uh, a really quiet community. Used to be a lot of second, uh, what, country homes, second, second homes. These uh, homes up here. What a, what a, what's attractive about it is it's about five minute drive from the expressway. So from there, you're like 45 minutes to Chitose Airport. Yeah. What else? It's got Ons, the ski resort, just behind us. And Zenibako is called Dream Beach. That's where they all go surfing. This neighborhood's being developed with new housing. This model house is a four-bedroom, three-bathroom, and it's built vertically. You enter on the ground floor, and there are two bedrooms on each of the first two floors, with a kitchen and living room up on the third floor. Also gas stove, dishwasher, and house control center that does everything from drawing a bath to locking and unlocking the doors for visitors. Up more steps, you'll find a rooftop area with an ocean view on one side and a view of the adjacent ski area on the other. The roof's also set up for barbecuing in the summer. Underwood's originally from Canada. He came to Hokkaido a couple of decades ago to work for a Canadian company in the timber industry and liked it so much he stayed. He says he has used the pandemic to develop an online presence and has begun to sell some properties over video calls. Undeveloped land is selling because people have an idea where it is. If it's a residential home, they would like to come and see it. If they're, if they're buying it for themselves, they would really like to come and see it. But after two years, they realize that they can't. So they've pretty much given up and now they are buying it through Zoom. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, don't know about, I don't know about the condos. I don't think they're selling well. The ski resort condos. Mm they're probably not doing so well because they're not getting any returns right. and just the management fees are really high. Okinawa real estate's on fire. Is Oki it? Okinawa and Hokkaido are just like probably the best markets in Japan. What is the process like buying in Japan? He says it does have its differences. The first thing would probably be the commission. In Vancouver it's 6%, the seller pays it. In Japan it's 3% buyer pays 3% and the seller pays 3%. Another difference is that nothing sells for above asking price. The price is the price. It might go lower, but it does not go higher, and nobody is in a hurry. Oh, there's no rush on the seller side. So if you can, you can make an offer, you can make the final payment three, four, five, six months later. No one's in a tearing hurry. People are always saying, I can bring the money tomorrow. That just creates problems for the judicial scrivener and the lawyers, because their paperwork's going to take a month anyway. Yeah, Japan's still on fax machines. With some of the clearest water in the world, MVA took local diving opportunities on the road to Singapore at Dive Expo. ADEX is the largest and longest running dive consumer and trade show in Asia. The MVA joined 127 other exhibitors, including fellow Micronesia destination Palau, and meeting consumers, trade reps, and media during the event, which was held at the Sands Expo and Convention Center in Singapore. This year's expo attracted about 29,000 attendees, including 17,000 consumers and 10,000 dive trade representatives and other guests. At its promotional booth, MVA says they share general information about the destination, details on air service to the Marianas, and various dive experiences available in Saipan, Tinian, Rota. And participants also received Marianas branded giveaways for taking a survey. MVA was joined by Axe Murderer Tur's owner and Master Dive Instructor Jay Wolf in promoting the Marianas at the event. Recovering from substance abuse often requires a system of help along the way. Those team members recognized recently at a half-day session held at the Kensington Resort. 
Director of Community Guidance, Kevin Villagomez. This month, the month of September, is uh, National Recovery Month, where we uh, you know, celebrate people in recovery from substance abuse and addiction. A powerful message delivered from a man who has battled meth addiction for years. I was just 14 years old when I had my first shot of liquor. 19 years old when I started using meth. Life was chaotic. I was always on the go and was barely, and there was barely time to just sit and relax. It was a constant routine that I was always looking for my next fix. I did a lot of things that I'm not proud of. I was holding friends hostage with something sharp against their neck and forcing my other friends to go commit robbery so that I can smoke more. I also attacked them when I found out they smoked while I slept and they didn't spare me some. My addiction consumed me to a point where I felt that there was no way out. For so many years, I loved the feeling of getting high and intoxicated. I was 25 years old when I first realized the insanity of meth was starting to take a toll on me. Then I started, uh, I then started making efforts to try and get clean. For several years, I tried to do it on my own, but with no success. At 31 years old, I decided to take another shot at treatment. I realized that I needed help with my addiction. I completed treatment at CGC, but I relapsed. I started with a few shots of, it started with a few shots of liquor, the next thing I knew I was drinking almost every day for a month. <coughs> After a month of drinking, I gave in to my cravings and all of a sudden there I was, with a glass pipe in one hand and a baggie of meth in the other. I felt myself slipping back into my old ways and I knew I had to do something about it. I'm not sure where I would be or what I would have been doing if I didn't get the help I desperately needed. You all are my heroes, because not only did you help me get clean and sober, but you guys saved my life. Some of those who are in recovery delivered their words via community members' voices. I want to thank my counselors, instructors, and drug court. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have met such amazing people at CDC. They taught us so much in life, and I am living proof that we can recover. I appreciate all that they do because they help me get my family back. If it was not for the help of treatment providers, my life would still be in shambles. Keep coming back. It works if you work it and it won't if you don't. So work it because you're worth it. What they do is very important. So we, we need to take time to recognize their work and, you know, continue. Give them that sense that uh, what they do is important and so that they can continue the work at hand. I'm very happy because the bulk of our addiction professionals in the CNMI um, were educated here through the public school system uh, to NMC and are being hired to places like the Community Guidance Center or SAR and other areas in, within the communities. They're just great listeners and uh, I know they, uh, their job was just to give me the tools that I need so that in due time when I do challenge the real world outside, I'm going, you know, to be better so that I can live a free and drop free life. I now have a reason to live. Well, you've all heard of TED Talks. How about Tech Talks? Docomo Pacific will host its next one this Friday, and you are invited. You can register for the Tech Talk at the following link up on the screen. It will happen this Friday, that's September 30th, from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. That's tomorrow standard time, and it will be delivered via Docomo Pacific's Max Meeting platform. Webinar is free of charge and will focus on managed Wi-Fi and how businesses can take charge of their network by unlocking features for increased visibility, reliable security, and better ability to control their network. Featured speakers include Seth Kaplan. He's the Senior Director of Product Management for Plume, and Russell Acampo, Senior Enterprise Marketing Manager for Docomo Pacific. Topics include the key benefits of managed Wi-Fi, including business insights, analytics, and success, ongoing industry trends, 
and the future of Wi-Fi networks in the next 10 years. Again, it is free. It's this Friday from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. tomorrow Standard Time. Fast, fun, and easy. That's how your home Wi-Fi should be. So start with an internet plan that fits your budget. Introducing your home Wi-Fi starter pack, also known as WISP. Enjoy up to 25 megabits per second for as low as $35 a month, plus a free router with your wireless subscription. That's hours of movies, games, social media, and more endless fun. Get your Wi-Fi starter pack today only at Docomo Pacific. Better together. Additional conditions may apply. Green sea turtles and hawksbill turtles call the Mariana Islands home. They're an important part of the marine ecosystem. They are under threat and they are protected under CNMI law. Keep plastic out of the ocean. Keep vehicles off the beach. Use the sea turtle stranding hotline if you see poaching activities or if you see a turtle in trouble. Call 287-8537 and save a turtle. Welcome back. You're watching the Monday night edition of the Channel 2 News. The Infrastructure and Recovery Program, or IRP, has archaeologists and an anthropologist on staff. Our Sally Lemus digs into this next story. The Infrastructure Recovery Program has been operating for about a year now. Currently, they have two archaeologists and one anthropologist on their construction and management team that focuses on assisting government agencies with streamlining the permitting process for federally funded projects in the CNMI. Jeremy Freeman is the lead archaeologist who is an expert in the Section 106 of the National Preservation Act. What our role is, is we will take on that aspect of the permitting process. Um, we ensure that they're compliant with the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, and we basically will take it from, from, from the beginning where we're helping to define that, that area of potential fact, uh, preparing a research design, and then taking it through, through the, all the correspondence and, uh, with, with the Historic Preservation Office, submitting the final report with our recommendations. Um, and then once the HPO receives that, then they can um, Ultimately, what, what they, they will step in with their role, which is to concur with our, our recommendations. Several major projects have accelerated in a timely manner since the inception of IRP. One of their successes is the improvements of the Oli Sports Complex before the Pacific Minigames. The project that we were involved in out there, um, the initial project that we were involved in were um, some of the more cosmetic, minor cosmetic changes to the, the, the complex that included um, um, 90 foot light poles that they had wanted to install so they could do some night events. Uh, they also installed, recently installed some uh, new bleachers um, for spectator seating. Uh, they um, moved the fence, so something as minor as, as moving the, the outfield fence was something that we were involved in as well. And they moved it in about uh, two, three feet, something like that. Uh, we were involved in monitoring for that. They demolished the old press box. Uh, so we were involved uh, in monitoring for that, mostly just to ensure that they weren't impacting any uh, potentially significant archaeological deposits. The team also assisted in the addition of a temporary parking space near the complex. What we did for that is we did an archaeological survey uh, in that area. They had, as far as we know, um, very little coverage as far as ar ar archaeologically. Um, and so we, uh, we we did the survey for that and, and we um, basically guided them to the, the uh, um, one start permit in that case, and it was all locally funded uh, to ensure that um, there weren't any concerns that the Historic Preservation Office may have and um, help them to uh, through on the development process um, and um, and help, I think in many ways, we helped uh, help them through the process of, of preparing the, the facility for for the games. IRP is also working on sewer projects in collaboration with the Commonwealth Utilities Corporation and the Garapan Revitalization Project. They are also assisting the Northern Marianas Housing Corporation with environmental assessments for the CDBGR program. And digging through the grounds of Saipan, the team has stumbled across some pretty interesting things. I think Gilly Street was kind of a big surprise. Yeah. Um, I 
honestly anticipated that because it was mostly under a road that it would largely be di disturbed deposits that we, we really weren't going to have much archaeological concern for. And it turns out that wasn't the case at all. We're actually finding uh, uh, quite a bit out there. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so it's, it, it, it's fortunate that we, we are involved uh, in the process because there's actually quite a bit that would, would have been lost uh, had we not been involved in it. The team also discovered a dog tag left behind during the World War. They were able to identify the owner and return it to the family. The IRP is led by former Land Secretary Marianne Terragetto. If you've watched KSPN2 over the years, you know we love to cover baseball. As Yankee great Aaron Judge continues his assault on the American League home run record, it was eight years ago today that Derek Jeter, the Yankee captain, number two, played his last game in, a Yankee, in Yankee Stadium, and KSPN2 was there. Let's take a look. New York in the fall is a pretty special place. Our first stop is in the Chelsea Market. This old Nabisco factory has been converted into retail shops and office space with much of the original building left intact. Google has set up shop right across the street with YouTube up on the fifth floor. Just south of here you can find the Freedom Tower. It's the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere and is slated to open later this year. It stands just next to the site of the former World Trade Center and these reflection pools sit on the original footprint of the two twin towers with the victims' names from September 11th engraved on the side. It's a sobering place. From here it's a short walk to the Staten Island Ferry where we get a nice look at the Manhattan skyline and the Statue of Liberty from just offshore. As we arrive at Yankee Stadium there is some doubt whether the game will be played. It's been raining much of the day. But the tarps come off and things are looking promising. It's the Yankees' last game of the year and the final home game for Derek Jeter, Yankee captain and shortstop for the last two decades. There are pieces of history everywhere, and after tonight, the Yankees will no longer have any single-digit uniform numbers left to give out. Jeter's number two will be retired, joining other greats like Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Mickey Mantle, and Joe DiMaggio. I'm here with my aunt and uncle, and we have great seats right next to the Yankees' team box. Willie Randolph is here, and we get to meet former Yankee first baseman Tino Martinez, who is here to see Jeter as well. After an emotional national anthem is trumpeted through the park, it's finally time to play ball. Orioles strike first, and the Yankees are quickly down 2-0 to zero when Jeter steps up to the plate in the first inning and promptly hits a double off the left field wall. The fans go crazy. Jeter isn't done. Later in the game, he comes up and hits a ground ball to short, which forces an Oriole error and puts the Yankees comfortably in the lead. During the game, there are numerous video tributes to Jeter from teammates, fans, and fellow players. The stadium is buzzing with the emotion of the night. As we start the top of the ninth, the Yankees are up 5-2, and it looks like Jeter has taken his final at bat at Yankee Stadium. But the Orioles are not done. They hit two home runs to tie the game at five, and I've never seen a home team's fans as happy as they are now, because the Oriole comeback means one thing, one more chance to see the Yankee captain hit in the bottom of the ninth. Jeter comes up, game tied at five, runner on second base. Here's the pitch. In true Derek Jeter fashion, a storybook career ends with a storybook final at bat. His single to right wins the game for the home team. It's a walk-off on a night of walk-offs. With a standing ovation, Derek Jeter takes a final walk to some of the most important real estate in the city of New York, the stretch of field he has lovingly patrolled just between second and third. He kneels down and says thank you. Thank you to the Yankees. Thank you to George Steinbrenner. Thank you to all who came before him and especially a thank you to the fans. 
As he slowly walks towards the dugout, he knows he will never play shortstop again for this storied franchise. It's a storybook ending and leaves all of us just shaking our heads. We all know there's no crying in baseball, but never say never. From Yankee Stadium, Chris Nelson for the Channel 2 News. Well, hot rods and scooters were out on Saturday night, and local fans got a treat. Let's take a look. Need a new phone? Trade in now and get up to $500 off our best 5G devices. Trade in your older phone in any condition and step up to better savings and speeds only our 5G network can provide. Check out our website and catch up on the best mobile experience. Trade in now. Docomo Pacific, better together. Green sea turtles and hawksbill turtles call the Mariana Islands home. They are an important part of the marine ecosystem. They are under threat and they are protected under CNMI law. Keep plastic out of the ocean. Keep vehicles off the beach. Use the sea turtle stranding hotline if you see poaching activities or if you see a turtle in trouble. Call 287-8537 and save a turtle. The Tan Su Lin Foundation promotes the culture of giving back. The foundation and its generous partners are committed to supporting programs that include health, education, and sports. Initiatives that promote arts and culture, the environment, and tourism will benefit our community and our residents. Giving back and making a difference will help ensure that the island paradise we call home will be a better place to live. Tonight's sports brought to you in part by Tan Holdings through the Tan Su Lin Foundation, making communities a better place to live. Point of sports fans.
Buenos sports fans, runners to your mark, runners get set, and runners go. Let's take a look at a local running effort. Public school system and Northern Mariana Athletics Cross Country 2022 third qualifier was held Saturday morning at the American Memorial Park in Garapan. 163 high school and middle school students from different schools in Saipan participated in the event. Students in the high school division must complete the 3.1 mile course while the middle schools do two laps or 2.1 miles. In the high school boys division, Pony Tang from HS crossed the finish line first. Followed by Jaira Wang of Agape Christian School. Third, Cody Shimizu of Marianas High School. Also in high school girls division, Caitlin Chavez of Saipan International School finished first. Another SIS student, Tiana Cabrera, came in second, and Mary Chu of Agape finished third. <laughs> Meanwhile, in middle school, Saipan International School dominated the boys' division. Sakel Moshe crosses the finish line first. Scoggins Taiga second. And third is Seth Sablon. Adelie Tafflinger of Dan Dan Middle School topped the girls' division. Barbara Wang and Lucy Hong of Agape finished second and third, respectively. And here are the highlights from the high school and middle school divisions during the event. Run Saipan Club, headed by its president, Edward De La Cruz, hosted this cross country's third leg. As of this time, they're still in the process of scoring the results for team standings. Fourth qualifying heat will be held this Saturday at the airport field in Dan Dan. Hey, golfers, come north and practice your game at the Marianas Driving Range. New Year's local specials. 10-piece coupon books available for just $60. That's a $10 savings. Want to get really good? Come work on your swing every day for just $99 per month. It's our practice pass, and you're going to love it. Grab your passes and go straight to the range. You can social distance and chip all at the same time, and the views are free. Reserve now at MarianasTrekking.com. You can pay online, open seven days a week. Hi, I'm Dre, one of the personal trainers here at Gold's Gym. 
and today we're gonna go over the cable lat pull down. Now what we wanna remember with machine-based exercises, there's really no right or wrong way of doing it. There's multiple ways of executing the exercise. What you'll often see is lifters executing the exercise in this fashion, and instead of working the muscles of your upper back, you're just irritating the shoulder joint, which is what you don't want. All right, let's clean that up a little bit. Let's sit upright a little bit more. Okay, as you get a full stretch, bring it down with your elbows coming in. So in general, as you set up this way, you're going to be feeling majority of the impulse right here, which is your lats. Okay. He's getting a full stretch and he's getting a full squeeze in the bottom. Here's your local weather report. Mostly cloudy with scattered showers and thunderstorms. South winds 9 to 13 miles per hour. Tonight, mostly cloudy with scattered showers and thunderstorms. It'll be south wind 5 to 9 miles per hour. High of 85, low of 76. Humidity creeping up there, 89% tomorrow. Partly sunny with isolated showers. South, southeast winds 5 to 8 miles per hour. High of 87 can expect a low of 76. Marine forecast winds and seas expected to subside the next couple of days as tropical disturbance 96W continues to move quickly north out of the region. Combined seas of around five feet will drop by a foot or two in the next several days. South wind 10 to 15 knots, wind waves two to three feet. Southwest swell three to five feet. Expect sunrise at 6.06 .06 in the morning, high tide at 8.10 p.m. low tide 205 in the afternoon and sunset at 6 10 p.m. That's going to do it for us on this Monday night on the Channel 2 News. Good night.